having me. Uh, everybody hear me okay? All right, fantastic. So I only have about 50 or 60 slides to go through in 10 minutes, so should be pretty quick. Uh, and they're very busy slides like this one, so you know, really just try to try not to get overwhelmed with uh, the awesome help you design it PowerPoint presentation from Microsoft. Uh, really did want to touch on the foundations of digital transformation. It is a blinking word. I think a, a lot of different folks interpret it differently depending upon where you're at in that journey and that uh, the chart that uh, Greg just presented. If you're starting in a place where digital transformation is certainly something I want to do, there's aspirations to do it, how do you get started? We've been on this path with, uh, with Purina for about 25 years. Uh, we took automation very seriously uh, when we started to build out our factories. We are a byproduct industry. What that means is we get the scraps of what's left over from the human food supply chain. So we get what we get, but we take nutrition and quality extremely seriously. So we have to modify our formulas based on which ingredients show up at the front door. And with that in mind, we had to automate the heck out of everything so that we get a consistent nutritional output. With all of that emphasis on automation from the start, we kind of had this culture of automation. And as we started to expand what our automation was, how do we work in the control systems, how do we start to analyze that and get better at what we do, we had a lot of trust in that data. But as things started to progress and cultures changed, generations changed, we're at this point now where a lot of that trust is, well, show me. You know, we've been proving this for 20 plus years, but as we start to get more modern and, you know, the Facebook and the Twitter and the social impact of, of all of the kind of connected systems that we're all used to in our personal lives, that trust of data has started to erode. And I think that's a, that's a key foundation of how do you build that trust back, and I'll, I'll get to in another very busy slide coming up. Value is another one of those. If you're not doing this with value, as, as Greg just pointed out too, you know, our, our objective as various businesses implementing a digital transformation is how do we get value out of doing this crazy thing that everybody says we have to do? So with that in mind, you should definitely be chasing value. And I'll, I'll touch on that in just a minute too. Ease of use. How many love to use the terribly complicated things that makes no sense? Yes. Excellent. Audience engagement. Excellent. Of course not. So you got to make it easy. If it's not clear, if it's not easy, nobody's going to pull on it and it's going to be uh, kind of a disaster before you even get started. So talking about trust, uh, we've got a lot of data out there. Uh, if you've been on this journey for a while, you're probably choking on data. But how much information do you have? I think that's a key differentiation. It seems like two silly words, data information is the same thing, right? Definitely not. Your information is derived out of the contextualization of your data. And if you're not taking that seriously by contextualizing it at the source to then use in whatever upstream system that is, it could be a control system, could be MES, could be ERP, whatever type of information you're looking to glean out of that glut of data that you have, good luck. You've got to contextualize that at the source. And how, do you, how does your data get eroded over time? It's when you don't understand what the contextualization is. We have a great example of that in our journey where we had a highly automated, fully interconnected, cascading reason code downtime tracking system. Every single time we went to prove that data, it was right every single time. So you get this report, your operations improvements teams get this report It says, go focus on this piece of machinery, there's, there's a bottleneck in this particular line, uh, go fix this. They kind of get the data and they go, oh yeah, well, all right, I guess it told me it's wrong. And then they go and fix it. But how many really believed it? Nobody had any input on that. So that concept of kind of that disconnected data contextualization because we were automating everything. And all the smart people that were adding the contextualization were very technical and understood all of the technical things associated with all of that cascading downtime. But nobody believed it. It was a failure. We had to rip it out. Now we do everything manually. What? <laughs> Everything's done manually for the most part. I mean, we automate what makes sense and try to eliminate the silly work. But with that in mind, it's highly contextualized. Everybody's doing it, so they better believe it. And guess what, if it's wrong, it doesn't really matter that much because you're definitely in the ballpark. And you got buy-in and people want to make it better and they've taken ownership. Huge aspect of digital transformation that I think cannot go underappreciated is really focus on those things. Get that buy-in, make that pull. Because if you're not doing that, 
All the rest is kind of for naught. The results tend to speak for themselves. When we took this approach three years ago, our improvements went up 10, 15% holistically for our factories. Huge, huge buy-in. And guess what? The data wasn't as accurate as it was before. Didn't matter. You had ownership, you trusted it, and it was used daily. Huge, huge pieces of this that I, I think the cultural aspects and the, the, impl the implication of buy-in and trust are at the foundation of everything moving forward with, with digital transformation. So focusing on value, we, uh, so I'm the director of innovation uh, in our digital manufacturing team. And what that means is I go out into industry uh, and I look for a particular solution, a vendor, somebody who's trying to solve something that we have a problem with, and I see if it makes sense. I take every vendor for its own merits and we, we kind of look through what they're trying to offer, what solution do they have, and we start small. I, I tend to, to kind of time bound us, forget all the NDAs and all the legal stuff that tends to calendar wise stretch out time, but we, we take a two week approach. If we can't explore and screen a solution in two weeks, then we failed. Again, take out some of the calendar time with the necessary paperwork, but all of that aside, we time bound ourselves to about two weeks. Moving out of that, we get into what we call a test, learn, and scale. And that test, learn, and scale is again time bounded to about 90 days. And what that means is we actually are doing a pilot. We've all done POCs and pilots in our factories. It's a similar concept. The start small is, is really a conversation uh, or a series of conversations. And that two week is we get a list of 10 solution providers. We trim that down to maybe two or three. We move that into a scale. And if it passes scale, we go. Go as fast as you can. But you better be focusing on value. Because if you're not focusing on value, it's cool to get the new shiny toy, but if you're not able to provide value and get that ROI, it's not happening, especially at scale. And that last piece is the, the sustainability. Don't underestimate what it takes to actually sustain this. Process-wise, there's a couple of different the process. I, again, very busy slides, I know, a lot of words. Um, but with the process, we, we mean the process of keeping it sustainable. There's the technology aspect, that's the infrastructure, break fix, you know, anything that's associated with that. But the process itself needs care and feeding. And you, you kind of saw that, uh, that slide from Greg, I love that, uh, you know, crawl, walk, run, and all the various stages until you get the cane. At the end there, you, you definitely have to worry about the, the luster has worn off. And, and what does this mean? How do you stay as relatively agnostic as you can to technology so that you can improve the process, continue to make that exciting and new and fresh every few years. That process needs care and feeding well beyond just, you know, keeping the PLCs connected, you got your tags right as your, as your capital investments uh, mature. All of that is certainly important, but, but that's, that's table stakes. You, you definitely have to focus on what it takes to make this thing widely adopted at scale. That is not an easy task, by the way. People ask me what I do, I say I'm a professional meeting attender. So that's pretty much what, uh, what that looks like. It's a lot of boring conference calls, but necessary. And the ease of use part. We, we focus on user experience versus user uh, interface. And five, 10 years ago, user experience started to become a thing. It was a term. And we all thought we, we understood it. Um, I used to run uh, our MES department, which was a highly customized platform. It was literally ground up um, based on Java and, and C++, uh, not based on any other system. So we had to develop all of our applications in-house, and we took user interface very seriously. But the difference between a user experience and a user interface for those uninitiated is a user experience is really based on behaviors. What behaviors are important? What do you want? that user to do, not how you, how, which field do you want them to enter data in, but how are they actually interacting? What do you want them to drive towards? What outcome are you looking for? Yes, of course, you need to make it easy. How many have read the interface uh, document and the training documentation for Facebook? <laughs> not out there, it doesn't exist. It's intuitive enough that you can just use it. That's the target from a user experience, and of course, Baked into that user experience is behaviors. 
the behaviors that are elicited on a mobile platform versus an HMI versus an MES screen are very different. What are you looking for from an outcome perspective? And that should be the first thing that's focused on, not the interface. You back into the interface. It might seem um, logical and, and like a dull moment, um, but that is not something to be taken lightly. Uh, psychology comes into that. Um, you know, of, of course, an engagement, enthusiasm, how do you keep that going, which gets back to that trust factor. So all of these things are kind of uh, connected. And is mobile necessary is kind of the last question I have up there. Uh, it is definitely, from a connected worker perspective, uh, you definitely want that to be portable as much as possible. That is our target first. But it doesn't make sense in every capacity. Sometimes you have an HMI that's just plastered to the front of a machine, leave it there. There's no reason to make it mobile. Um, there are certainly aspects where you can physically mount a mobile device. Yes, that is certainly a target and an easy lift. But I think to take that mentality of what absolutely is necessary from a connected worker and a mobile perspective needs to be considered because it is not the answer for everything. Some things you do need some real estate on a screen. And when you make that self-sizing to get down to an iPhone size or, or some sort of mobile device, um, it doesn't make sense and you kind of lose some of the, the important information. So seems like a duh question as well, but uh, I, I definitely think it needs some focus as you're kind of uh, working towards what type of systems do you need to modernize and, and digitally transform. I only have 50 more slides, so I'll, I'll have to be quick. Uh, the general approach we take, uh, I, I mentioned what we start off with from the explore and screen perspective. Uh, find a good partner. We've got a lot of good partners, some of which are in this room, and we, we take that seriously. Uh, that partnership is not something that we, we definitely kind of gloss over. We're not looking to what can I get out of it. Uh, it's what can we get together. And I, I think that truly does make a good partner uh, we tend to ask for things that we think would be marketable. Not only we'd get benefit out of it, but other customers. So you can't go at it alone. I took that approach about 10 years ago, failed miserably. So you definitely need a partnership. Strong partnerships go a long way. Focus on the people. Got to be the people. Got to focus on the operators. Operators first. That's who's running your line. Uh, if you have a series of management reports that are needed, and that is your initial question, probably approaching it wrong. So focus on who's going to be entering that data. Single source of data is a huge, huge, huge piece of this. If you can keep that thread of continuity from single source of data from the factory floor and aggregate it however you need up into a series of management reports, then you've won. It's really that simple, but it's not that easy. <laughs> it, trying to get that contextualization at the source and be able to aggregate that all the way up to the top of the food chain, it is, it is very difficult. Um, we have pockets of success, um, but again, I'm a professional meeting attender and that is definitely what it takes. Keep focused on value. If you're not relentless about value, costs can get out of control and the new shiny toy becomes totally unaccepted because you can't afford it anymore. Uh, that is something that you, you need to ask that question uh, about every six months. Is, is it still worth it? I have a series of repeating meetings uh, that you know, everybody does. You have your cadence meetings. Uh, about every five or six meetings, depart, depending upon the, uh, the, the um, frequency of them, I ask, is this meeting still valuable? Could be meetings, could be digital transformation, could be the product itself. Uh, we've canceled meetings as a result. Everybody kind of, oh, no, not really. This meeting kind of sucks, Chris. OK, we'll cancel it. <laughs> so um, that's OK. And then the last one, which is a, a huge uh, thing that we feel in our department, is do not push. We have two products that are pushed. They're necessary. All of the other 50 plus in our, in our portfolio are all pull. If nobody's pulling on this product, why do you have it? It's not providing any value. So really, really take that seriously. Don't push. Uh, allow for the pull. And I think it'll go a long way. I ran out of slides. I thought there were more. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, guys.